And this is what I say to America's women. Do not tell your daughter you don't like math or you were not good in math because as soon as you say it and as soon as she has a problem, she's going to say, I'm like my mother, right? I can't do it, right? So the woman said, well, what, what am I supposed to say? I said, just say you didn't have the best experience or that you and the teacher didn't connect, but don't say you don't like it. Don't say you're not good at it. Say you have an interest in learning it. There's the difference. Okay, so all of you said you were good in math. Now, I will tell you that my mother went back and became a math specialist also. So she was a language arts specialist and a math specialist, and I was her guinea pig. <laughs> so, and what she came to understand was her ability to solve word problems was directly related to her ability to read well. Because, you see, I was telling Isaac, you don't talk about engineering or medicine in problems, that is, in numbers. You express a problem in what? In words. And then you go from the words, maybe to symbols, an equation, and eventually you come up with something that's quantitative, a number. But you have to be able to hear or read the words. And so she began to use me to figure out how do you get somebody to get ex excited about word problems. Now, I will tell you, I got my worst grades in my mama's class in the eighth grade. <laughs> I got Bs in my mama's class. My son, who is 35, says, Dad, get over it. You got those Bs. Leave it alone. <laughs> Dad, you are a mega nerd. <laughs> now, my son is 35, and I say to him, yeah, but mega nerds can pay their bills all the time. Oh, <laughs> if you got grown children, you know what I'm talking about. Oh, oh, then he shuts up. Oh, there we go. But here is here's what I want you to think about. The way we think about ourselves, the language that we use, the way we interact with each other, the values we hold most dear will be so important. We will be known by those things. You know, I am very proud in my state that we are working very closely with our elected officials from both parties and that our state has agreed over several years that nothing will be more important than K through 12 and university. So believe it or not, through all the difficult times, the one part of our state that's been protected, our universities and our K through 12. Give Maryland a hand for that, would you please? <laughs> and what that means now, we have a certain responsibility to be effective and efficient and to make sure we're using the resources as we need to, and, but also to be as connected to the business community and to be working to create jobs. My campus is a place that has 85 companies now on campus, biotech and IT companies, started by faculty, started by new PhD, um, PhD graduates. And what's interesting is, so hundreds and hundreds of my students are already working in those places. And our message is this, that we want to get students, whether they're in languages or in math and science, involved in possible careers as early as possible because hands-on experiences will tend to produce really well-prepared employees. And so, for example, I've got 900 of my graduates now working full-time at the National Security Agency. All right, give me a big hand for that, big hand for that. They are mathematicians, computer scientists, and linguists, but all the companies in cybersecurity, the biotech companies. And when I talked about the need to make sure we're looking at different careers for students, some of you know this. Every kid is not, is not ready and does not want to go and spend four years in college getting a liberal arts degree. Now, we have to think about that thing. It's easy to say every kid. When I think of college, I think of post-secondary opportunities, two and four year. I have, we see biotech companies in our area looking for many more technicians, people who've gotten two years of training, you see, who can do that. That does not mean, when somebody said, well, you're being elitist, Freeman, no, I'm not. I know what I see. I see large numbers going to college and large numbers not graduating from college, not getting any degree. I want to make sure that student gets some kind of training that will lead to a job. What I tell the parents of prospective students at UMBC is this. If your son or daughter comes in and does what we suggest and gets into those internships and research experiences, we will guarantee you that when she graduates, she will not have to come home and live with you. Give me a big hand for that. <laughs> parents like <laughs> I tell my students all the time, you think they want to, you to come back to that room. Now, they want to use that room for something else. All right, and they, want, and they do not want you coming in at two in the morning saying you grown, all right, in their house, right? Have your own place if you're gonna do that with your own job so I don't have to pay your rent, am I right? So the idea of helping students to get jobs is really important. And what I want you to think about is this. 
whether someone is going to a two-year program or a four-year program for post-secondary training or a four-year degree, here's what I want you to think about. The skills they will need are the same. I, have, I bring inner city kids from Baltimore, not to my campus, but to the community college right there, who say they like cars. I get them involved in an auto mechanics program, which is a computer training program these days, right? And all of a sudden, they can't make it past developmental mathematics. They have not learned to read it. They don't understand that to become an auto mechanic, you have to be able to read and think and listen and solve problems. The same things you talk about when you talk about the reading and the thinking and the speaking, you've got to do those things. We've got companies where you've got computer trained technique, I mean, uh, uh, people, professionals, who are working with a range of people with car problems. They're sitting there in the office with the computer, able to look at the car, to listen to the problem. They are solving problems. They are listening and trying to give support to the person who's having the problem. They are analyzing, they are reading things. The same skills you'd use in higher level engineering, you're using right there in that technology work. So whether talking about the two or four, keep this stuff, the skills are the same. The ability to read and think, to analyze problems, to express oneself in writing and in, in, in verbal form, uh, in oral form, and most important, a kind of persistence to keep working on the problem. If you look at the Common Core Standards, one of the most critical points is that we must teach people you can't always solve problems like that. Now, how many of you have read Daniel Pink's A Whole New Mind? Some of you read it. It's about left and right brain thinking. His newest book is called Drive on Motivation. But that, I like this left and right brain thinking because it makes this point. We are moving from the information age to the conceptual age. And it says this, for those who are going to thrive in this new time, given all the data, given being just overwhelmed with data. We must be able to use both our left brain, logical, analytical, sequential thinking, but we also need to be able to use what we get from the arts and humanities, the ability to set the context, the ability to understand the meaning in things, the ability, quite frankly, to get out of the box sometimes, to be more creative. How many of you, let me ask this question, how many of you believe that there are many more brilliant Chinese and Indian children than American children? It's always an interesting question. I ask this all over the country. And the first thought is people say, how could he even ask that question? That doesn't even sound politically correct. <laughs> you know, we believe in political correctness. Now, on my campus, I want you to know something. I have been very controversial because I have wanted kids to say what they really think, not what they think we want to hear. And you see, on my campus, right within the state of Maryland, you got the Eastern Shore of Maryland, you got Montgomery County, you got people with all kinds of views of Americans, right? And there are a lot of views that will upset each other. The question is, how can you have good conversations, respect each other, and have different points of view? We ought to be able to agree as Americans with civility and learn from each other. Give me a big hand for that idea. Well, here is the, the answer. And you want to always, as educators and business people, there are many more brilliant Chinese and Indian children than American children. Let me prove it to you mathematically. Now, I get goosebumps when I do math. Goosebumps, goosebumps. <laughs> there are 1.3 billion Chinese in the world. There are 1.1 billion Indians in the world. You put those two together, you have 2.4 billion people, okay? The top 10% of any population will be extraordinary. What's 10% of 2.4 billion? Y'all like math. What's 10% of 2.4 billion? 240 million. Very good. Some smart folks in this room. I have been in rooms where everybody's going, ah, uh, uh, I said, oh, I'm in trouble now. <laughs> 240 million, right? Well, how many Americans do we have now? About 320, 320 million? I want you to think about it. Those two countries have almost as many geniuses as we have citizens. You get my point? See, we are a powerful country. I think we're the greatest country in the world, but we are a small country in population. You with me? So if you go to anybody's engineering PhD program from NC State, I'm sure, to UMBC, wherever you go, you're going to see large numbers of those two groups. Now, you add to that that people who come to this country in large numbers, people who come to this country are hungry for the knowledge. If you look at the Nobel laureates that we are so proud of in our country, from the humanities over to the sciences, you will see a disproportionately large percentage had parents who came from other countries. Throughout the 20th century, if you look at most of the Nobel laureates, I mean, large numbers, you'll find that they came from European countries. The parents didn't speak English well. The kids grew up in New York City. 
They went to the poor man's Harvard, City College, and Brooklyn College. They went on, and they became Nobel laureates. Now, there's something inspiring about that. I want us to be inspired by the fact that people who get here within the first generation are so proud to be in this country that they want to prove what they can do. And interestingly enough, my students, you know, the big joke at UMBC is UMBC, University of Maryland, Baltimore County, stands for you must be Chinese. <laughs> we like that. We like that. We like that, all right? I have no shame, all right? College presidents don't have any shame, all right? Because some of my little white students from Montgomery County, which is a weather county, were upset when they saw some more Chinese American kids getting in, they said, oh, you must be Chinese. I said, it means we like Berkeley. It's the most prestigious public place in the country. So what's interesting about that is this. We talk about both international diversity and domestic diversity. It's important to talk about both, though, because you want to also know, this is what I have to, if I were not careful with some of our special programs, all of my black kids would have parents from other countries. I want to make sure that I've got kids who are black who's got grandparents from South Carolina. You get my point? We want black and white kids and others from this country who've been here for generations also to do well. It's not enough to educate the wonderful young people who come from other countries. We, we are working with them. That's brain power. That's great for our country. But we don't want to leave behind little poor white kids and poor black kids who have been here for generations. Give me a hand for that, please. <laughs> Very important. And the thought I want you to keep is this, that when talking about the challenges we face in America, it's not just about race. I am as concerned about my poor little white kids from rural areas in my state. I want to make sure we're doing the things we need to do to inspire them, to support them. You know, I was in Georgia speaking to the Georgia Association of School Boards, and I'll never forget a gentleman who was CEO of a big company that came up and he said, Dr. Bowski, he said, I'm inspired by your civil rights story. He said, you know, we know that, that the civil rights movement helped women and minorities. He said, but let me tell you a story. He said, my mama took care of her family living on a place, on a sharecropped place. We were sharecroppers. And my mama saw that the little Negro children were being encouraged to go to college. She says, I want you all to go to college too. And because of the inspiration from that movement, my mama, who didn't finish high school, did everything she could so that I could go to college. And once I went to college, I pulled my younger brothers and sisters into college. He said, and here I sit today, CEO of a company with an MBA, all because I was inspired by that civil rights movement. He said, America owes Dr. King and the civil rights movement a lot this day. Give that man a hand, would you please? Here's my point, that we all, the point is this, if we're going to succeed, we want to make sure that children are learning to do the reading, yes, and the writing, yes, and the speaking, and the thinking, but I want you to add the math to it. Here's the math problem I want everybody to work on for the rest of the day. Sixth grade math problem in college board. I'm getting goosebumps, folks. Where are my math, math teachers in the room? Math teachers do not use Venn diagrams. Math teachers do not tell people the answer, all right? Here's the problem. 29 children are in a class. 20 have dogs. 15 have cats. How many have both a dog and a cat? I'll say it again. 29 children in a class. 20 have dogs. 15 have cats. How many have both a dog and a cat? I want my English teachers, my social studies teachers. I want everybody thinking about that problem. Now, there are three groups in the spirit of a whole new mind in this room right now. You got those, the math teachers, and a few others who really love math going, bring it on. And they're acting like they all relaxed, but they are dying to get the answer to that problem because they're going to show people how smart they are. That's the same group you got in your class, that little group right there, like Isaac, right? Then you got some on the other end saying, why would he give us a math problem? He knows we can't do it. <laughs> so I got to look like I'm interested when I know I'm not interested because I know I can't do it. I'm not going to even try. And then you got some in the middle saying, I'll try, but I don't really think I can do it, all right? I'm telling you, we must all show an interest in math. We must teach parents. You don't have to solve the math problem to help the math teacher. Just show an interest. How many problems? How many problems did you have from the teacher? How many of them can you solve? You can't solve these two? Write down what your question is, all right? And the next day, what did the teacher say? Show me how you did it. In other words, we have to get our parents to be as involved in, as possible. It helps a teacher when somebody at home reinforces what that teacher's saying. Give me a big hand for that. You know, 
well, but when you talk, Bob, about this complexity, if we can get our families understanding, they don't have to have the education themselves to show the interest. If we can get business communities inspiring us by giving us problems we can use, most math kids will say, show me how geometry is used, and it's not enough to say it helps you think. They need to have specific examples. What has made the difference in our academic innovation is using the problems from the companies, biotech companies, IT companies, in the curriculum. So in chemistry discovery, we no longer talk about just lecturing like this. We've got group work. We've got collaboration. We've got use of technology. The students are responsible or empowered. We don't give them the theories. They have to figure it out, thinking about real life problems. And everybody plays a role. They hate it at first because they say in high school, they said, if you're smart, you don't need anybody. Well, that's not the message we want to send. If you ask companies, how do people solve problems, not only in science but in general, it's in teamwork. It's in learning to work together. It's the soft skills. It's learning how to ask questions. I, I, Robbie, a Nobel laureate, said that when he was growing up in New York, all of his parents, friends' parents, would say, what, what did you learn in school today at the end of the day? He said, not my Jewish mother. My Jewish mother would say, Izzy, did you ask a good question today? And the practice of encouraging my curiosity, he said, made me the thinker. We became, I became, I want you to encourage the children to ask good questions. Encourage the children to get engaged in the education. Tell them, as Dr. Martin said, that to be the best, you have to work hard. You have to learn how to keep focusing and being persistent. And then you've got to have the right attitude. You know there are two kinds of people in the world. There are people who can suck every ounce of energy out of your body because they're so negative. You know who they are. Some of y'all in this room right now, you know you are. Just kidding, just kidding. Kinda, kinda. <laughs> I'm making a point about humor. Innovative groups. We can't beat the Chinese and Indians with numbers. What we have is creativity. How can a, a country with such a small number be the greatest country in the world? It has been innovation throughout our history. It has been creativity. You know, our kids are very creative, very innovative. They just need to know more. But they are very innovative, innovative right? They'll tell you in a heartbeat, I don't know, you're wrong. They don't, they don't mind telling you you're wrong, right? Maybe just wrong themselves, but they got that confidence, right? We want to keep that creativity. I want you as teachers to think out of the box, to be as kooky as possible. I want math and English teachers talking to each other. I do want you to think about the question, how can we bring more quantitative thinking into our discussions about whatever we're doing? I'm looking at the shape of this room. I'm looking at rectangles and parallelograms. I'm looking at the idea that there are so many ways we can talk about the numbers statistics and common core standards. Math people, we need to get our English teachers helping us in thinking about this connection between the language and the math. So there are people who are negative and then there are people who can elevate. And those people have a way of inspiring you to want to be better than you are. I have no doubt that all of you are here today, business leaders, people from foundations, teachers and principals, because you understand the power of education. You know, at the end of my mama's life, my, mother, my wife had convinced her to come and live with us. And all of a sudden, we realized she had been so smart, she had concealed the fact that she had dementia. And you never want to see your parents going downhill. One day, and she didn't even know who I was, and I was an only child. One day, I asked her, what's important to you? Because she said, I know the end is near. You don't want to hear that. And she said, relationships. She said, my relationship with my God, and she said to me what she'd said all my life, hold on to your faith, you'll be okay. And then she said, my relationship with my husband, daddy had been dead 20 years, he had forgotten. And then she looked me right in my face and she said, you know, I have a son. And all of a sudden, my grief turned to anger. I'm thinking, don't you tell me you, got, you had a kid when you were a teenager. <laughs> don't you tell me I got a brother. I, if I had a brother, this way, I don't want a brother. I'm thinking like my students, TMI, too much information. Uh-uh, uh-uh. You keep that to your grade. Don't you bring, don't you? I'm looking mean. I'm saying, what are you talking about? It's like the movies, right? And all of a sudden, she said, he's a college president. Thank God she was talking about me. I'd forgotten. Wait a minute. <laughs> but then she gave me the real gifts, and I give it to you. She said, but you know I now understand teachers touch eternity through their students.